November 22nd, 1963, in a shocking moment broadcast across U.S. television, President John F. Kennedy is assassinated in a motorcade riding through Daly Plaza in Dallas, Texas. As the nation mourns, the world remembers another major figure to fall only four months earlier, the beloved pontiff who had inaugurated the Second Vatican Council, Pope John XXIII, had passed away after a battle with stomach cancer. Now, Catholics across the world turn to his successor, the newly elected Pope Paul VI, for hope and answers. How would the church reach out in a broken world, a world wounded by war and divided by previous conflicts? Join us as we meet with historians and theologians, eyewitnesses and experts to investigate the meaning of Vatican II and uncover the event which would become a definitive landmark in the history of the modern Catholic Church. As the Second Vatican Council reconvened in the fall of 1963, a tangible excitement passed through Rome. Bishops from around the world came to gather once more in the Aula of St. Peter's to discuss the most pressing matters concerning faith and the modern world. The Council had started just a year before, with the late Pope John offering an inspiring address. Gaudet Mater Ecclesia, Mother Church Rejoices. I think a lot of the bishops thought they were coming to Rome for some good pasta, some great Italian wine, two months of time together, and then they were gonna go back to their diocese and the, the council would be over. The Pope kind of opened up the horizons for what the bishops could do. That first address um, did a great deal to change the whole mindset of the council. But during this earlier session of Vatican II, the bishops had first been faced with the complicated task of voting on new commissions. You've got to do some bookkeeping. You've got to take care of some, some logistical stuff. And the most important thing is that all of those preparatory commissions that were producing all those preparatory draft documents, they no longer exist because the council started now. So what you now need are 10 commissions that are going to take over the work of the preparatory commissions. On the opening day of the first session, each member had been given a ballot with 160 blank spaces in order to nominate 16 bishops to 10 new commissions. These delegations would spearhead the composition of what would become the Council's final masterwork, a series of dogmatic constitutions, declarations, and decrees addressing the life of the Church in the face of contemporary circumstances. Confronted with an excess of nominations and little knowledge of bishops outside of the Roman Curia, this proved a daunting task for the Council Fathers, especially those who knew few other candidates outside of their own countries. But a group of bishops came up with a plan. No sooner is the announcement of an election given than Cardinal Leonard stands up and makes a motion for an immediate recess. Now, the president that day was Cardinal Tisserand. Cardinal Tisserand's looking at him and saying, how can we have a recess? We just started five minutes ago. And before anything else can happen, Cardinal Fring stands up and he seconds the motion. And Cardinal Leonard then explains he would like to have an immediate recess so that the bishops can gather in local regional language groups so they can come up with their own slate of candidates, of bishops that they would like to see on these commissions. Well, no sooner is that motion announced than there's spontaneous applause from the entire assembly. And there's no choice but to give a recess. This recess would be crucial to the council. As the bishops met within their own groups, new nominees outside of the Curia from far off countries were appointed to the commissions. They're able to bring the concerns of churches from the Philippines and India and Mexico and Brazil and the United States as well as France and Germany and obviously Italy. All of their voices were now going to be part of the Council's deliberation. That happens the very first day the Council meets and it changes again the mindset of the bishops. They begin to sense that they have something they can contribute. The excitement of the bishops would reach new heights 
as they spent more time together discussing theology, faith, and their respective cultural challenges. Not all of the bishops were equally competent in Latin. In fact, some rather noteworthy bishops, you know, their Latin was pretty poor and people had a hard time in pronunciation understanding what they were saying. And then just go on to the fact that you're listening to one speech after another. Well, fortunately, Pope John had encouraged them to set up these coffee shops behind the bleachers, the, the bleachers that lined each side of the nave of, of St. Peter's Basilica. The Pope had joked that you needed to give the bishops a place where they could go light up a cigarette or they'd never make it through the day. That was his argument. But they were nicknamed, you know, they were, one was called Bar Abbas and one was called Bar Jonah. And the bishops, when they'd had too much, could go, leave, you know, leave their seat while a speech was going on. They could go get a cappuccino, smoke a cigarette. Entrenched in the atmosphere of 1960s Rome, the council bishops soon realized that the coffee bars were where some real lively theological conversations were taking place. Add to that the fact that the bishops are staying in Rome for 45 to 60 days. They're going out to dinner. Um, it doesn't take them long before they realize that some of the world's leading theologians are actually gathered here in Rome at that time. And so they start asking some of these figures like Pete Franzen and Karl Rahner and Henri de Lubac and Barnabas Ahern, major figures, right, in various areas of, of Catholic scholarship. They start saying, look, could you give an evening talk on this? We're, we're having a debate right now over our understanding of tradition. Per Congar, could you give a lecture on this? We know you've written a great deal on it. And Congar would give an evening lecture at the, at the North American College, perhaps. And maybe initially 10 bishops would show up, and then 40 bishops at the next lecture, and then 120 bishops, right? As fellow members in the body of Christ, these periti, or theological experts, would come to help guide the Council Fathers in their continuing education as teachers and shepherds of their people. Aside from being led by a new pontiff, the second session of Vatican II opened with signs of major shifts. From the beginning of his new pontificate, Pope Paul VI had implemented a new set of council guidelines. He made it a point to simplify the organizational aspects of the bishop's discussions. For the first time in the history of ecumenical councils, guest observers comprised of both lay Catholics and non-Catholic religious from diverse faith communities had been invited to take part as part of the late Pope John's initiative for interfaith dialogue. The second session of Vatican II opened with a revived hope for the Church and set out to continue on the path to reform and renewal under the leadership of Paul VI. A very intelligent Pope, someone who had been a career a Vatican official who knew the insides of the Vatican quite well, but who also who had great pastoral gifts. One of Pope Paul's great tasks was to continue where his predecessor, John XXIII, had left off with the council bishops. These bishops had begun discussing a document on the church, a dogmatic constitution which would come to be known as Lumen Gentium. The title of the constitution on the church is uh, The Light of the Nations, who is Christ. Sometimes people hear Constitution on the Church, the light of the nations, and they say, oh, the Church is the light of the nations, and how can that be since it's a sinful Church? But the light of the nations is not the Church, it is the Christ. The uh, first teaching that was important in Lumen Gentium had to do with the dignity of the baptized. And all the baptized are called to uh, full participation in the Church, uh, that is, to holiness, to mission, that it's not just that, that the priests and religious somehow take care of the church and the, and the baptized are passive recipients of their activity, but they are the agents, they, they are the uh, protagonists in the uh, church's mission to the world, and therefore to really bring lay people into the, the consciousness of their being the church in the world. In drafting this new document, the bishops described the church as both mystery and sacrament. By definition, a sacrament is an outward sign of inner grace. The bishops explain this in Lumen Gentium by first pointing to the Trinity as the ultimate foundation and source of the Church's life. God the Father offers His love and salvation. Christ, as true man and true God, redeems through His sacrifice on the cross. 
and the Holy Spirit inspires mankind, dwelling in the church and in the hearts of the faithful. The Council also describes the church as the body of Christ. The sacrifice of the cross on the altar and the celebration of the Eucharist both unify believers not only to Christ, but also together with each other as the body of Christ. All are called to the Paschal celebration for deeper unity with God. It comes right out of St. Paul, 1 Corinthians, Colossians. Uh, the church is the body of Christ. Each of us are members of the body. Um, but some felt that, you know, if the church is the body of Christ, then how can the church ever make any mistakes? So there were theologians that were also reaching for some other images from Scripture. And one of them was people of God, and hence the title of chapter 2. A very intelligent, very, very smart theologian writing in Germany in the 1950s, his doctoral dissertation by the name of Joseph Ratzinger, uh, later to become, of course, Pope Benedict XVI, he made a very shrewd point. He said, you know, uh, the people of God is a powerful and important Old Testament image, but it is insufficient by itself as a, a definition of the church because we are the people of God only to the extent that we are grafted onto the body of Christ. To the extent that we are incorporated into the body of Christ through the Eucharist, through the celebration of the sacraments, through reception of the Word of God. So you cannot really have the church as the people of God without at the same time saying it is the body of Christ. Vatican II would reaffirm Christ as the head of the body who established for his people shepherds who would lead them, the bishops of the church. They succeed to the College of the Apostles and thus become a college themselves. Lumen Gentium would speak of the collegiality of the bishops so that together with the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, and never without him, they shepherd the people of God. The Episcopal collegiality, the idea that the bishops are not just you know, like local managers of the church, but actually each bishop in, a, in himself is, belongs to the Episcopal College and is successor of the apostles and has his own right by virtue of the sacrament to uh, govern and teach and sanctify in his local church. And so the Episcopal collegiality really completed the teaching of Vatican I about the authority of the Pope by showing that it's shared with the bishops around the world. Prior to Vatican II, this is something of a truism, of course, that if you had to use an image for the church, it was something of a pyramid. Well, there was that traditional image before the council of the church as a, as a pyramid. What happened to that image? Yeah, well, some would say that the uh, pyramid got turned upside down, but I think that's a little bit simplistic. Um, I, I think the pyramid captured a, a kind of uh, theology of the church that was really focused on the visible structures, on offices, um, basically, what are the powers of the Pope uh, in relation to the bishops? What are the, the faculties needed to celebrate the sacraments? Vatican II would go on to redefine the Church's hierarchy in a way that preserved the authority of the Holy Father in his role as the successor to Peter while acknowledging the bishops in one unified apostolic mission. While the Council reiterated the teaching of Vatican I on papal infallibility, it reminded the Church that all of the bishops assembled with the Pope can also teach infallibly. Thus, when all of the bishops around the world teach in union with the Holy Father on divine revelation, they are exercising this charism. For so long, the idea is you've got the Pope's claims and you've got the bishops. And the idea is if you raise up the Pope, you have to diminish the bishops. If you celebrate the authority of the bishops, you have to diminish the Pope. Vatican II punctured that zero-sum game. And one of the ways it did it is to remember that the Pope is himself a bishop. He's the bishop of the Church of Rome. So it's not one or the other. The College of Bishops is only a college when it's in communion with its head, the Bishop of Rome. And the Bishop of Rome never acts without in some way being in communion with all of the bishops. For me, the image now is that of a circle. And I call it a circle of communion. It's the whole church. Uh, that forms this uh, community that, that is a circle of commun communion. Now, usually when we hear the word communion, we think of Holy Communion, but actually uh, the Second Vatican Council uh, recovered a word from the first 1,000 years 
of the church as a community, that is to say, a people that has so much in common. It was uh, in the aftermath of Vatican II that one sees it more as a circle with distinct roles within the circle. Uh, one of the fundamental changes of Vatican II with regard to the preliminary documents was that what had started the preliminary document, the notion of the hierarchy, has now been transported into chapter three of the Constitution on the Church. Uh, and so what I try to show is the structure of the Constitution on the Church of Lumen Gentium, uh, how it builds organically. Uh, chapter two, the people of God, is not the laity. It's the whole people of God. Chapter three is the hierarchy. Chapter four is the laity. But before there are those distinctions, important as they are, uh, chapter two speaks of what we hold in common, our common baptism. The Second Vatican Council has given the church a very beautiful vision of communion in a sense that we discover ourselves as a people of God, as a community of faith founded by Jesus Christ on the foundation of unity. The new code of canon law, promulgated in 1983, built on Lumen Gentium's principle of the church as the communion of all the baptized. It helps the people of God to exercise their roles, their proper roles, within the communion, uh, based on a common baptism that we all have. And our participation in the life of the church as Christe Fidelis, as members of the one body of Christ, uh, we now have functions. Each one of us has a function, has a role to play within the ecclesial communion. As highlighted in Lumen Gentium, the Holy Spirit guides the church and the council renewed understanding of this dynamic spirit in the very life of the church. The Spirit provides gifts to all God's people. And in Lumen Gentium Article 4, it says, the Spirit bequeaths to the church gifts that are both hierarchic, and by that it meant uh, church orders, and charismatic. And by that it meant, of course, the gifts that are given to all the baptized. Lumen Gentium details the role of the people of God according to the traditional description of Christ's mission as prophet, priest, and king, or shepherd. As a prophetic people, the faithful proclaim the Word of God, particularly in their way of life. As a priestly people, they join in Christ's sacrifice of Himself at the Eucharist. And as a royal people, they seek to bring others closer to Christ, the true Shepherd. All of the baptized are equally members of the Church, and Lumen Gentium speaks to the dignity of both men and women. There was another teaching in the uh, Constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium, uh, number 31, which said that there is no inequality in the church, there's no discrimination in the church on the basis, same thing, of uh, nationality or ethnic origin or uh, sex or race. And again, that was uh, based on a scripture text, Galatians 3.28, that says, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, man nor woman. And so that was, uh, th these texts were used to establish the fact that women had equal rights and equal dignity on the basis of both of being made in the image and likeness of God, that's for everybody, and in the church on the basis of being baptized, having a common baptismal vocation. But Lumen Gentium also reminds us that the church is essentially missionary. Really going out to the people, uh, engaging with the people, um, not being afraid, not being worried about anything, but really knowing who we are as an identity and then sharing that with those outside, uh, with the people of the church, uh, that has been very great for me. Men and women in consecrated life play a specific role in the mission of the church. The council was very interested in addressing not only the universal call to holiness, that was really the principal idea that Lumen Gentium wanted to put across, everyone's call to holiness, not just religious, but they said religious have a particular role to play. They don't have a, a place in the structure of the church as such, but they belong to the church, to its life and holiness, and therefore they're integrated into the church uh, through the approval of their constitutions. 
Lumen Gentium would finally be completed by the bishops and promulgated by Pope Paul VI at the end of the third session of the Council. The collegiality of the bishops conveyed by this dogmatic constitution has taken a particular institutional form in what is known now as the Synod of Bishops. So for example, the synod we're having uh, right now is an expression of Episcopal collegiality. Every four, three or four years, the Pope will call bishops from around the world who will be able to give counsel to the Pope, give advice, uh, report on what's happening, uh, give suggestions about what, how the church might address a particular issue. And all of that is an expression of Episcopal uh, collegiality in a, in a broad sense. Lumen Gentium proclaims the church as the means of bringing Jesus Christ as light of the nations to all of the world. But how do sacred scripture and 2,000 years of tradition enable the church to proclaim Christ today? Tune in next time on Vatican II, Inside the Council.